Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sal Cosevera, president of Cora Capital Advisors, and I'd like to welcome you to the July edition of Cora College. I uh, apologize uh, that we're running a few minutes late. We just had a power failure <laughs> in Marlton, and um, we had to boot our computers back up. And uh, also, we're now waiting for Jane uh, Fern Zimmer, our guest speaker. Uh, to get herself situated as well as she's on the other side of Marlton. So um, I get to uh, fill a little time, uh, I guess, right now. Uh, so um, pardon me here as I stumble around, but I am quite literally powering up different things on my computer as we speak. Of course, this is the time that my computer decides to update all of the software, which is not making things any better. So uh, the, the purpose of today's meeting was to have Jane speak uh, specifically uh, with regards to estate planning on elder care planning. Uh, Jane is an estate and elder law specialist, and uh, we have worked with Jane uh, for a number of years uh, with clients uh, as they're uh, preparing for what I would call end of life. Um, it's, it's making sure that uh, clients have all their documents in place. Uh, perhaps it's clients that uh, may uh, be in a situation where they need Medicaid planning. Uh, uh, we also have had clients that uh, need um, need guardianships uh, if they didn't have their uh, specific documents in place that, that they need to. So there's, there's a number of reasons why uh, you could need an estate planning uh, specialist uh, as, uh, as well as somebody that specializes in elder law. So uh, Jane, it looks like you're, you're back with us now and good to go. I'm here, how is the sound? Uh, the sound is much better. Thank you. And Thanks, thank you so much. Yep, you're you're very welcome. Um, and I am uh, getting ready to I'm going to share my uh, desktop here in a second. Um, wait a minute. Sorry about this, everybody. I had this all set up and ready to go. Okay. okay. And so Jane, I already introduced you. I don't know if you could hear it when I was introducing you. Perfectly. Um, I will, I will uh, uh, take control of the uh, slideshow if you want to get, get going. Fantastic. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. I'm here to talk about how to avoid a crisis, um, documents you need to avoid a crisis, and you know what we can plan for. And basically, nobody knows the future. We all probably buy insurance. And elder care planning is a lot like that. You, you, know, you need to get the most suitable policy in place for your needs. And you hope against hope that you don't need it. But if you you know, if you do need it due to a healthcare crisis, you now have the ability to pivot and get yourself the best care, get your loved one the best care, protect your assets, um, maybe, maybe maintain family harmony to the extent that you can. And life is just a whole lot easier when you're not in the fishbowl scrambling to, to sort through a crisis. So for example, um, most people, if I if I walk down the street and I quiz ten people, you know, hey, do you know um, how to pay for long term care? Most people would say that Medicare would cover everything. So you know, we're talking care and nursing home. Um, statistically, it's relatively likely. There are certain chronic degenerative conditions that make it more likely. So if you've got a family history of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's multiple sclerosis, um, Lewy body's disease, dementia, vascular dementia, 
uh, those are things that, that really suggest that you, you want to be proactive in planning for care. If you like a nice lifestyle and you want to stay home and not go to a nursing home, you want to be proactive and plan for your care um, because the, uh, the better you plan, the more choices you have. So if I quizzed maybe 10 people on the street, uh, if you know they were going to have to pay for a nursing home, how would they do it? Probably nine out of 10 of them would say Medicare. And that's, that's kind of a common misnomer. Medicare pays for some care some of the time. We'll talk about that more. But my point right now is that I want to explain to you why it's important to have certain documents in place to make it more likely that you get something other than Medicare, i.e. Medicaid or veterans benefits or long-term care insurance, which is the best option uh, to pay for, your, pay for your care rather than using your life savings in your home. So basically, um, it's everybody should have a power of attorney. A general durable power of attorney is a document that gives somebody that they trust the ability to make financial and legal decisions for them. Why is this important? Um, it's a basic tool in elder care planning. And so a lot of you, you know, probably you're all responsible people or else you wouldn't go to core capital advisors. And so, you know, you probably already have these documents, but um, you may want to have them just reviewed from an elder care perspective. For example, just today in my office, I had a very, very sweet family, very loving, and they had a parent who had um, Alzheimer's dementia. It's coming to a head. And they, they went and, and they, they figured they would do the thrifty, the responsible thing. And they went to the uh, base, you know, McGuire. And I guess there's a legal office there. And because the, the mother was a widow of a military veteran, they were able to get her a beautiful military power of attorney. And it's very comprehensive. It's got a lot of good provisions. And I'm reading this thing, and I realize that it really it's it's got almost all the bells and whistles, but it really doesn't have what I need. And she doesn't know who the president is, um, which, depending on where you stand in the political spectrum, may or may not be okay. And she uh, she doesn't know what year it is. She knows what month it is. She doesn't know how many grandkids she has. She can name them though. And so I, you know, she's not really clearly able to make decisions. Um, so don't let this happen to you. You know, the, the moral of the story is you get what you pay for. They thought that they were doing the right thing, helping to protect mom's assets and, and going to get basically a free deed, but it was done by an attorney who, who does a million of these, does a really good job, but does them to protect a young, healthy spouse who's going off to a military battle um, in a very different set of circumstances. And so the concerns that you would have in preparing a power of attorney in that circumstance just do not come into play in elder care planning. You probably need different provisions. So, you know, if you have one little takeaway today, get your power of attorney reviewed by an attorney that does elder care planning, you know, all the time. Uh, the other thing you need, I'm sorry. If I can ask a question, because um, this, this actually came up in a meeting today. How long does a power of attorney actually last? Because when, when we're dealing with them with Cora Capital and some of the custodians, usually once you get to five years, uh, they're, they're not acceptable. And it's been our experience that some financial institutions after just a couple of years won't take them. So, so I run into all the time with a large brokerage firm um, that I'm not going to name, but it's always that particular firm. And um, I do it at least once a year. Somebody calls me up and I get my letterhead out. I write a letter. And in New Jersey, powers of attorney, if they're durable, they last until death or revocation. And in New Jersey, there's a, there's a law that says that the financial institution is required to accept a you know a copy of the power of attorney, not even the original, if it's still in full force and effect. So I have this cute little seal that my admin made for me. And it basically says that this, this power of attorney is in full force and effect. 
I have a conversation with the person who made it, who signed it. You know, they haven't revoked it. And so I just write a letter and I certify that it's still in full force and effect. And by the way, here's the statute. And, you know, when can I expect my client to have access to their accounts for the power of attorney? And it usually fixes the problem. Um, if you were to revoke the power of attorney, that's a different story. But that's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a financial institution that, that wants the assurance of an attorney's letterhead that it's okay to go ahead with the transaction. And they're probably just trying to protect the account holders, but it, it's terrible when it happens with somebody who's got dementia, who's declining and, you know, it's just a mess. I had, I had a lady in that situation back in the, back last winter and her uncle had named her power of attorney. Um, she didn't even know it. And he got very ill and they went, she and her cousin went through the house to, to find documents and she discovered she's power of attorney and the bank won't accept it because the thing is probably 10 years old at that point, but it was still valid. He hadn't revoked it. So if it's okay. durable, that means it endures um, from the moment that it's signed until death. Okay. After death, you can't use it. So like a lot of people want to use it to pay the funeral director. Um, and, and that's not a good idea because it's revoked. So don't do that. Okay. You could purchase a pretty easy arrangement. Um, so you need to have a power of attorney that really, it really protects you. So, you know, I don't care if you're married, if you're widowed, um, if you're in a partnership, whatever, you need a power of attorney because that, uh, that gives somebody you trust the ability to manage your affairs. Um, you also need to have a living will, which is a document that allows you to make healthcare decisions that allows somebody else to make healthcare decisions for you. And it prevents a terrible situation. I don't know if you've heard of the Terry Schiavo case. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it's designed to prevent that situation where there's a battle between relatives over what this person wanted in terms of end of life care or even, you know, pulling the plug. It's a terrible way to put it. The other thing you probably really need is a last will and testament unless you have a very simple situation. Um, I never heard of anybody that, that, that loved their family and said that they want their relatives to fight with each other and the taxing authorities when they died. And if you don't have a power of a, a, a will, um, that's kind of the situation you're, you're setting up. Uh, you're setting things up for probate litigation. Even worse, if you write your own will, um, you're probably setting everybody up for probate litigation. There are a lot of nice products you can download on the internet, but probate law is pretty tricky and, and complicated. Even in a probate Fenry state like New Jersey, uh, I have a great blog and I think it's in the materials and it just talks about why will is important, how it can actually save you money. And one of the things it does is it allows you to waive the bond requirement um, that somebody would have to post if you didn't have a will. Basically, you have to post a bond, which is, like, which is like insurance, to ensure that your creditors will get paid and that your beneficiaries will get what they were promised and that you don't go off with the money to, I don't know, the next hot place for vacation and decide to live there and not come back. Um, I think we're probably way, let me, let's go to slide number three. Oh, there. And we talked a little bit about what a living will does. And a lot of people say to me, well, I have a post. Why do I need a living will? And what's a post? A post is a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And it's basically a doctor's order that's signed probably at least in the last year of life. It governs end of life care. Do you want a DNR? Do you want to be resuscitated? I have three kids. I love my kids. I will be working probably until I'm 92 to support one of them just because she's good, but, but you know, different. Um, different strokes for different folks. So I want every means necessary to revive me, God forbid something should happen, so that I can come back from the grave and support this child. Um, you may not have that same desire. You may have reached a point at some point where you know, you just wanna let me go. And you can do that with a let me go, um, a, a DNR in, in a post and also in your healthcare proxy. But a post is just a very short document it's in your medical chart, it's your doctor's order, they have to obey it, and there's no rooting around, there's no um, reading a longer document, 
the healthcare proxy is good to have. You should have it, and they have to follow it. But you know, post is really end of life. That is what the doctor says goes. So you know, put it on your fridge um, with your with your nice magnets. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so mm -hmm. let's let's do the general durable power of attorney. So that's, you know, that's the document we were talking about a minute ago. It designates the right person, somebody you trust to manage your affairs. The reason why you really need this is, is it a, avoids a guardianship. If I don't have a power of attorney, I've got a terrible habit of, of checking my cell phone. I love Facebook, can't stay off it. So I'm looking at my Facebook and I'm walking into the street and boom, a car hits me and now I need a guardianship. And because I didn't do a power of attorney, um, now my kids, my adult kids, if they wanted to get my bank account to pay the property taxes, if they want to sell my house, they have to go to court and get two doctors to agree that I'm not able to make decisions, which they might be able to do, but it's expensive and slow. So, you know, if, if you don't like going to an attorney, if you don't like paying legal fees, you're really, really, really not going to like a guardianship. And a guardianship is a great way, or a power of attorney is a great way to avoid that. So, you know, pick somebody you trust. Um, a lot of people come in and they want to put all their kids in the power of attorney because they don't want to offend any of them. And if the kids can work together, that's a great way to have another set of hands. If there's any kind of disharmony, don't do that because eventually, if the kids won't work together, the power of attorney will not be usable and you're looking at a guardianship. You could have avoided that. Jane, um, uh, we, we've had this come up um, and, and certainly you and I have actually shared clients that have had to um, deal with this with uh, elderly parents. Um, we've had a few situations over the years where we've had a husband and wife uh, that didn't have the proper documents in place. And am, am I correct in saying that uh, the the legal proceedings for something like this are ten plus thousand dollars, and and we're not talking about days; we're talking about months. If, if you're doing plan for a guardianship, yeah, it's it's it could be awful. Um, if you are talking about asset protection planning through a guardianship and having a court having to go to court to get an order giving you permission to sell the house, yeah, it can be expensive if somebody challenges it. Um, Say you have a grandchild and, and the grandchild has a lot of issues and grandma at one point promised him that he could live in the house. Um, if he's not a good person, he could convince, conceivably make a claim that the house shouldn't be sold. And now you've got to litigate this thing and you know that the claim is worthless, but you still have to give him his day in court and that's expensive and it's slow. So it's much cheaper, much easier to do it with the power of attorney you don't have the court oversight, you've got much more flexibility and you can protect assets much more quickly as opposed to waiting for a decision from the court when your attorney is calling the judge and talking to their assistants and going down in person to see the surrogate to see when can we expect to receive a decision on the motion allowing you to get reimbursement for a guardianship of all the money you've supported mom with over the years. It's, it's rough. So, um, those are some really good reasons to have the power of attorney. Well, thank you. Um, should I go to the next slide? I think so, yes. So we talked a little bit about, um, there we go. I think that's a duplicate. Let's go to slide number six. Um, reasons why you need to have a will. And I wanna be mindful of my time. Preserving a family harmony. This, you know, Timmy and Johnny can't get along at a family dinner. Um, how are they going to decide how to distribute your property? It's a lot easier if you just tell them how to do it and, you know, make something clear, readable, user-friendly. Uh, also, if you, if you are leaving money to somebody who is not a direct lineal descendant, not a child, not a parent, but maybe a sister or brother, now you have inheritance tax. How is that going to get paid? A will can address that and avoid a problem. Um, so these are some great reasons why to have why you can have a will. Um, I there there was a question that that we had in advance that um, this is a great spot to bring it up 
And it's the unintentional uh, disinheritance um, where, where, you, um, where you may have uh, thought that your will covers something, but in fact, assets don't ever get to your will. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so uh, wondering if you could explain what the will actually covers. So, yeah, this, I've seen this come up. I think I know what you're talking about. Stop me if I don't. But I think you're talking about a situation where maybe client went to an attorney and gets a will, but doesn't actually work with the attorney to retitle the assets and understand an estate plan, or they draft their own will. Yeah. And or, or, or a client thinks that um, what they're going to do is uh, inside of their will, they're, they're going to give um, the children you know, an equal share of, of the assets, but they don't realize that they put little Joey as the primary beneficiary of their IRA and that the, the beneficiary on the IRA supersedes whatever you have in the will. Right, so that's why it's important. This can happen. You have to understand how an estate is funded and the estate has to be funded in a manner that gives it liquidity. For example, if I have a client who has a house, um, I'm not gonna let them write a will and an estate plan that doesn't allow for the funding of the house. Do they have cash that can be earmarked to just go into the estate? So that whoever is the executor, whoever's marshaling the assets and taking care of the estate has the ability to pay the real estate taxes without dipping into his or her own pocket. Um, do you have, you know, or selling the house immediately at a low, lower price than they might otherwise be inclined to hold out for because they don't have the money to pay the carrying costs. And, um, you know, it's a problem. So it's very important not only to work with an attorney to draft a will, but to review all the assets. And one of the things I do, and I think a, a good practice in general is, is to write an estate planning cover letter with the will that explains the will so the client knows what they're signing and how it works and also breaks out all the assets. And at that point, the client can back, come back to you and say, oops, we forgot about these six accounts. Or, you know, you know that you're talking about the same things and you can give them instructions on how to retitle the beneficiary designations because different types of assets are handled different ways. There are two big categories of assets. One is probate assets, and, and they're over here on the left, my hand's outside the camera screen, but that's what I'm trying to communicate. And then there are non-probate assets, assets that do not probate over the will, and they're just a totally different pot. So anything with a beneficiary designation, anything with a joint owner with right of survivorship passes by operation of law poof, at the moment of your death. And at that moment, the other owner or the designated beneficiary has the legal right to those assets. They may not yet have access to it, but they have the legal right. For example, if I'm married and my husband and I own a house and I go and die, because I can't stop looking at my Facebook um, and I walk in the street, then, um, if we're joint retitled on the deed, the minute I pass away, the deed is solely in his name. Now, um, when he passes away, if he hasn't remarried, now that deed's in his sole name. So it's not gonna go to somebody else. Now he needs a will for that deed in his sole name to um, pass to his heirs. So generally a will is gonna cover property that doesn't have a beneficiary designation, property that is not jointly titled, and property is only in the name of the decedent. It could be a truck. It could be a bank account. It's always an IRA because you can't put IRA assets, 401ks, in somebody else's name without having a terrible tax consequence. So um, you're always going to need either a beneficiary designation or a will for these types of accounts. It makes, you know, some people say, oh, well, I don't need a lawyer, I don't need a will. I'll just put beneficiary designations on all my accounts. If you want your executor to hate you, that's a great thing to do um, because now they're not gonna have money to run the, the, the estate. There's we, no money to pay for a tax we, return. Yeah. You can't pay an attorney. There's no money in the estate because it's all non-probate. 
we we actually just had a case uh, where the beneficiaries had to give money to the estate to cover uh, Pennsylvania inheritance taxes because so much was given away um, by beneficiary that there was no money in the estate to cover the taxes. Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they pull back gifts in within a certain look back period. It's different lengths of time from different states. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you need to plan for liquidity to pay any inheritance taxes and to pay any income taxes. What if the decedent had dementia and had some assets and didn't pay their taxes, didn't take their minimum required distributions and there's an income tax mess? Um, you need to be able to have that. What if you have a business and there are a couple of kids and one of the kids worked in the business and one didn't, you're not gonna put the kid that has no business experience or interest on that business. Um, that's not gonna work out well. And you need a pot of liquidity to pay them. Life insurance might make sense or cash, but the attorney really has to put all the assets in the spreadsheet and figure out, well, what are you gonna need in terms of cash for the estate and how are we gonna do this? Gotcha. Do you wanna move on? Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about why you need to plan ahead for your long-term care. Um, it only pays, Medicare will only pay for long-term care for a short period of time, some of the time, and at most up to 90 days per spell of illness. Um, sometimes you don't even get Medicare coverage. If you go into a hospital and you're there, the typical rule is, is three days for a qualifying stay. But if you're on observation status, Say you have going to heart block and they don't know why. And by the time they get you out of the emergency department into the hospital bed, uh, you're now in, in stage one heart block, not three. And they really don't treat that. They're afraid to send you home in case you have another episode, um, but they don't really know what the problem is. Now you're on observation status. And if you go into, if it turns out uh, you, you have a stroke because they didn't get a pacemaker in you, um, in time. Now, you don't have Medicare picking up your um, your qualifying, your, your nursing home care or your rehab for up to 100 days per spell of illness because you're on observation status. You were never actually admitted. You were just in a bed. They were watching you. They weren't actively diagnosing you because they didn't know what the diagnosis was. So make sure if you go to the hospital that you're not on observation status if you have a three-day stay. That is, so, that that's is key. That, that's a great tip. And I have to say, it's not one I'd ever heard before. Uh, and um, I'm sure most people don't know it. It, it has very real ramifications, unfortunately. Yeah. So let's, yeah, there are very complicated rules for Medicare secondary payer. Basically, if you have Medicare and some other insurance, there's a complex set of rules and you have to coordinate your coverage. That's all, I'm not gonna get in the weeds given our time restrictions. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you want to be careful every, every year there's something called open season and basically if you don't like your Medicare plan you have the ability to change plans um, no matter what your circumstances are if you're in Medicare between um, October 15th and December 7th usually are the dates that's the dates that'll be this year in 2023 and you can pick another plan there are other opportunities if you're in a nursing home, you can change your plan because the nursing home's coverage, you know, might be a little bit different than, you know, what the nursing home takes um, might be different under different plans. And the plan that you went into the nursing home with might not be a great fit for you. So if you're in a nursing home, you can work with the business office for free to get the best plan. Uh, if you are in a special enrollment period because you had a termination of coverage, maybe you got divorced, you have eight months to pick a new plan. And so, you know, you want to plan ahead. People get entranced by Medicare uh, PPOs because they have, you know, nice benefits. You get to go to a health club. Um, I don't know what all they give you, but, but basically uh, they tend to be very less generous with your plan and you, you don't get as good coverage. And so people are often switching back to traditional Medicare. So just keep that in the back of your head. If you're in a nursing home, you might be able to do that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so there are two basic different ways to pay for long-term care. One is the way you probably don't wanna do, 
And that's just paying privately with everything you earned, everything you saved, you and your wife. Uh, and unfortunately in New Jersey, um, spouses are responsible for their partner's necessary care. So you as a spouse had a big interest in figuring out how to pay for your partner's care. Uh, the other way is how to pay for it the smart way. The best way to do that really is, is long-term care insurance. If you buy that, you know, people come to me every year and they're, oh man, we got this long-term care insurance. They're complaining, they raise the price again. It's expensive, do I need this? And it's almost always more affordable to, to pay the premium than it would be to pay privately at $14,000 a month for a nursing home. So if you have the ability to obtain long-term care insurance for your employment, um, the state of New Jersey at one point had some very good policies. Private employers may have it. It's a great benefit and you absolutely should take advantage of it. And if you can get a policy that's portable, it allows you to protect assets and stay at home and control your care. I, I, um, I want to put a, a quick uh, core capital uh, plug in here. So uh, some, some clients are not aware that uh, besides investment management and financial planning, uh, we also have a very robust insurance subsidiary, and uh, we do work with a number of clients for long-term care insurance. And the the plans that are are available today, most of them actually are built on life insurance chassis, as opposed to uh, what was uh, the the previous more traditional long-term care plans. And what's nice about that is. The premiums are defined, the benefits are defined, and you don't have the risk of premiums uh, going up. Um, you're, you're making lump sum payments or you're making payments over a specific period of time. And the one thing that it, it, it in a way can erase is this stigma that clients have where they say, I don't want to pay for something when I may not get a benefit from it. Uh, and you know, none of us probably wants to pay for car insurance or homeowners insurance. We're we're forced to most of the time. And with long-term care coverage, there are solutions available that that, in a sense, allow you to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, so you're making um, deposits to you know various types of programs. You can at least rest assured that some or all of that money is going to come back to your family uh, one way or another. So it's. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of different options that are out there. Are these hybrid policies where you if you don't use the long term care component? Yes, yes. So they're they're life they're they're really life insurance policies with long term care riders, and uh, they've they they've evolved over the years. And you know we can do a whole separate core college session just on those those types of plans. Uh, and now that I say that, I think we will. But uh, what what clients like about them is they can deposit their money in there and they can they can get it back. There's refund options. There's death benefit options if they pass away. And ultimately, um, if they need long term care, they're they are using their own money in a way, but they're leveraging it with uh, the insurance companies. So instead of instead of uh, paying dollar for dollar, maybe you know maybe you're getting three times the benefit for your dollar. It allows you to decide where you want the care to take place. Most people want to stay yeah. at home, and you can do that. I, I have never met a, a client that has looked me in the eye and said, I can't wait to go into a nursing home, Sal. You know, like, back me up. Oh, yeah. um, I haven't heard that yet. Yeah, everybody wants to stay home, and everyone thinks that their spouse, their children, their grandchildren, whatever, uh, will be able to take care of them. And uh, as I pointed out to a client this afternoon, it's not physically possible. You know, if you think it is, you know, have your spouse lay on the floor and try and pick them up and let me know how that goes for you. Um, That's a great and, way to put it. And and it's it's also very difficult for your family. Um, you know, a lot of us and and I, I'll throw myself right in the middle. You know, I've got I've got a son who just graduated college and I have a mom who's in her 70s and, um, you know, I run a business. I have a wife, you know. It's I can't I can't just go and take care of my mother. My sister can't just go and take care of our mother. We have other things going on, and and nobody thinks about that. They think, oh my god, I'd never do that to one of my parents. But the the reality of it is, 
um, you may not you may not be able to avoid it, and it it's better to have a plan uh, in place that doesn't revolve around I think an individual having to take um, uh, that type of action. It's better to have that maybe as a backup. But you know everyone has their own opinion. Yeah, and you you have a relationship with the parent at some point. You want to be just the kid and spend time with them while you still can. Yeah. And if you're if they're their primary caregiver, you just don't have that luxury. Um, the other thing that I see happening is people, particularly with the chronic degenerative conditions that we talked about earlier, um, if they have longevity, the course of their the progression of their illness is such that they get to a point where they their body just doesn't work, and so they can't be cared for at home. Yeah. And they need an interdisciplinary care team, a dietitian, because they can't eat right. And, you know, they need a parade diet. They need a nutritionist. They need an activities director. They need a, you know, physical therapist. They need all of these different um, care team members to give them 24 seven wraparound care. And it's too much for one person. And it, it just can't safely be done at home. Um, let's go to the next slide. So there are all these smarter ways to pay for, for public benefits. Okay. So. Medicaid kind of has a uh, dirty uh, connotation, like it's people think Medicaid and, and they don't know what that is. Um, and basically it is a very comprehensive wraparound health program that provides pretty good comprehensive care in New Jersey and funding for care. So it, that being said, it, it's probably the biggest funding source for nursing home care. How are we on time? Uh, well, we have about 10 minutes, and then that leaves us a few minutes for questions. All right. So basically, Medic Medicaid is a great way to pay for long-term care if you can tap into it, but it's also the payer of last resort. If you have some other way to pay for care that is not Medicaid, Medicaid is not going to pay for your care. So, you know, basically, the government has a fiscal responsibility to the taxpayers and if you can pay for your care with your own assets, Medicaid's you know, not gonna pay out for you. So the good news is that there are legal ways to take advantage of um, discrepancies in the income tax rules, in the Medicaid planning rules, there are exceptions that allow you to plan ahead. And you can take a married couple, and if they don't do planning, they pretty much lose everything. Um, they can lose the house with a Medicaid lien on it if it's in both spouse names, and they can lose most of the assets because Medicaid has financial limits. Um, that's without planning. So let's look at Baby and Johnny. Baby and Johnny have been married for 35 years. Uh, Baby is the breadwinner. She's supporting Johnny by teaching dance lessons. And Johnny has Alzheimer's and needs long-term care. So he's really got him done the wrong thing. He's put Baby in a quarter and nobody puts baby in a corner. So how are we gonna get baby out of this corner? Baby and Johnny have a home and maybe it's worth 350,000 and it's in joint names like most homes are. And so if Johnny goes into a nursing home and goes on Medicaid, when he dies, there will be a Medicaid lien on the home if we don't fix that title. So that's part of our planning. Um, but if, so if Johnny and baby just do their own Medicaid planning at, at home themselves, and they don't fix the deed to the home, um, they're gonna have a problem. Johnny and baby also have liquid assets of 350,000. There is a Medicaid resource limit for a married couple in their situation of about 148,620 for baby and $2,000 for Johnny. If Johnny has even more than one penny over that, limit or a baby has, you know, if they together have more than 150,620 uh, in their name, then Johnny will not be Medicaid eligible until they spend down below that limit. So that means that if they do their own planning at home, there's a Medicaid lead in the house because they didn't fix that. And now, you know, they have this 350,000 in cash. So they're way above that 350,620 limit. So they're spending down about $199,000, probably by paying Johnny's nursing home. And that's a lot of money for baby to just kiss goodbye. So there's a better way to do it. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
if they work with an elder care planning attorney, even if they didn't do it proactively, um, you know, they, they have it, they are able to, to work with somebody who knows the facilities, knows where to get the best care, um, maybe has other clients in that facility already and can negotiate a, um, an admission. Whereas, you know, if Johnny has behaviors, they might not let him in uh, into a good facility. So the attorney can leverage relationships for the client. Um, we, we covered this, you okay. know, basically what uh, baby can keep without planning is very limited. Um, and she'd have to spend a lot in Johnny's care. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So working with an attorney, in addition to getting Johnny a good placement and probably the best care, um, baby can keep the house. We're gonna take the house for, and put it in baby's sole name using a power of attorney. And that's why just to tie things full circle, it's important to have your power of attorney looked at by an elder care attorney proactively before a crisis. So you can just do this. You can just change the deed using Johnny's power of attorney that he already had that had the right provisions. If you hadn't gone to an elder law attorney, now you might be planning through a guardianship, which is expensive and slow and you don't wanna do it. Um, let's look at the cash. Baby can keep 150,619. We actually want her a little bit lower, um, just as a buffer. And she's got about 199,000 in excess funds. And you know we can spend down on a prepaid burial, we can see if the home needs to be fixed up. Um, maybe baby needs a new car and whatever is left over, we can invest in a Medicaid annuity in baby's name. That is an annuity. And let's I'm just making it up. Say it's, I don't know, 180,000. And it, uh, it's gonna pay about 7,700 a month to baby. And this will go on for about two years. So baby is basically just tying up the funds in an annuity, dropping below that 150,620 limit because that annuity is not countable. Medicaid knows about it, it's legal, but it can't be counted against her in determining Johnny's eligibility. And now she's got a way to basically keep that 180,000 that we didn't spend down that was excess resources and still get Johnny on Medicaid now. So she's, they've saved nearly all of their assets and they've gotten Johnny good care and they protected the home. And now baby can be just the wife and go and visit Johnny. Um, so this is you know, just a synopsis of baby and Johnny's elder care strategy. We protect the home by changing the deed. We update baby's will to disinherit Johnny because what happens if, if baby dies first? And we've done all this planning and now the assets that were in baby's name go back to Johnny. Um, that's gonna kick him off Medicaid. He's gonna have to spend them all down and it's a problem. So what we could do is just update baby's will to either disinherit Johnny or give him only elective share. You choose different options based on the situation. I'm not gonna get more in the weeds. And uh, you know, baby keeps some cash up to about 150,000 and the rest, you know, they do things that they need including a Medicaid-friendly annuity. Yep. There are more materials about the annuity and its attributes, how it works, different mm -hmm. scenarios, different examples in the materials. The annuity works because it's exempt for Medicaid under federal law. Johnny keeps his income and he's gonna pay that to the nursing home. Um, and baby keeps the income from the annuity and her income from dance lessons, she keeps the home and the couple's savings in addition to the 150,000 that she, she has in her name. Um, and so I, I wanna let everyone know, by the way, uh, we'll be emailing uh, this presentation to you and also uh, a number of collateral documents that Jane has provided us, including information on a Medicaid annuity. Uh, so that um, you, know, you, you have the, uh, the latest and greatest at your fingertips. Um, the, the, a question just came in, and, and th this is one that I actually get a lot as I have a number of um, single clients uh, um, you know, at, at different stages of life. But uh, so the question is, 
looking for a future without a partner or children to assist, should I need care in the future? What do you recommend that uh, someone do about um, elder care and, and their documents and insurance, et cetera? So a couple of things. Number one, before you do anything, call Sal, go to Sal, get long-term care insurance because that will greatly expand your options. Number two, get, you need to be proactive. You particularly, people in this situation, particularly need to be proactive and they need to be thorough. They need to not only get a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy in place, but they need to have that difficult conversation with the person that they've selected as their agent to make sure that the agent's gonna make decisions that this principal wants them to make. Um, for example, I had a friend of my mother's, lovely lady, gave power of attorney to her niece and um, gets sick, has surgery, goes into rehab, and the niece is saying that my aunt can't go home, even though my aunt's competent, and my aunt has a beautiful home, and my aunt desperately wants to go home. My niece, who, her niece who's in Virginia, is saying, well, I'm the power of attorney, and the social worker, shame on her, was listening to her until I got involved and straightened it out but we basically did a new power of attorney um, so that we knew that the person Aunt Jane picked would actually do what Aunt Jane wanted. And then we had a number of conversations about well, what was it that Aunt Jane wanted. So you can you know, have this um, proactive approach and that way, hopefully there are no surprises. Um, you also might wanna think about a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community, that's where you pay a lump sum and buy into a community. And you know that might be an option if you really have no relatives, no friends, nobody that would help you. But everybody has somebody. Um, and if you don't have somebody, just give me a call. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we, we had another question pop up, which I, I actually answered in the chat, but uh, the, the question was, can you have more than one uh, long-term care insurance policy? And the answer is yes. Um, the, uh, now, what's interesting is there's different ways to collect on long-term care insurance. Uh, there are some that are, that are more uh, what they call indemnity policies, which I, I think about more as like traditional uh, reimbursement of healthcare expenses. And then there's others that are cash policies where if you're in a, uh, and it doesn't even have to be a nursing home, by the way, and, and there, there's, a big, there's a big misnomer here. Um, most people are probably not going into a nursing home. Uh, a number of them may wind up with home health care or, or, or some type of continuing care community. And um, you can collect cash benefits if, if you need care. Uh, the difference between an indemnity and a cash benefit plan is, it, it, there's different pricing, there's, there's you know, different structures and uh, clients need to, to make the uh, decision that's best for them. Most people like a, a cash uh, type of plan because nobody wants to have to deal with sending receipts and waiting for reimbursements and everything that comes along with it. Um, but we do have clients that have multiple long-term care insurance. Some of them may have bought them years ago and then they're adding on to it now. Uh, or you know they 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 have an older policy that we don't want to get rid of because the older policies as they were written were so much better uh, than they are today. Long term care insurance is really interesting. Um, it's it's actually one of these uh, types of insurance where the longer you go, the worse the policies get, not the better, um, because the insurance companies keep learning that they keep mispricing the products. So the reason Jane was speaking earlier about all those. Um, all those, those premiums that keep going up for people, it's because 20, 30 years ago when they were first writing these, uh, they, they made two huge assumptions that turned out to be horribly wrong. Um, the first one is that uh, people would um, drop coverage at a certain point and nobody, nobody drops their long-term care insurance. The other one that seems kind of really stupid, quite frankly, is that they didn't count on people living as long as they do. <laughs> Uh, medical, they, medical technology has advanced and yeah. you know people that would have died 30 years ago now are living 
Exactly. Um, you know, we we uh, uh, personally had a situation where over the weekend someone had a medical issue that um, probably would have killed them uh, 10, 15 years ago. And quite literally, they were in and out of the hospital in 12 hours. Uh, it, you know, these are the types of things that that continue to happen and people are living longer and they're holding on to their insurance and uh, the insurance companies are kind of taking a bath, uh, which is why they've moved to these more hybrid type policies now. Uh, I, by the way, in the chat, I posted a, a number of the documents. So uh, I, I believe that um, the participants, you can download them onto your desktop, but we will email uh, those documents out uh, along with the uh, copy of the presentation. We'll also be sending out a, uh, a link uh, to this video so you can watch it again. Uh, it's also available on Core Capital's YouTube channel uh, as, as we post it um, probably uh, tomorrow. And I guess before Jane, I let you go, um, I did want to see, does anyone have any more questions that they, they want to throw out that I can address? Give people a second to uh, type. And again, I apologize for our uh, delayed start earlier. Thankfully, the power did not uh, go out a second time uh, at, uh, at our office, but I guess people are running their air conditioners uh, a lot. So, um, Jen, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I, I want to say, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was incredibly informative. Uh, I um, will be sending out your contact information to everyone. Uh, we, you know, Jane, while Jane is not the only attorney that we uh, recommend Jane, Jane's aware of that, um, I, I will say that she is by far the first person that we think of for elder care planning. Uh, she is very much an expert in the field, and um, for, for us at Cora, she is our go-to, she is our resource. And um, you know, if, if any of you have any questions or have any need for Jane's services, please do not hesitate to reach out to her. 